So should we be spending more money in our business or should we be saving more money in our business? Well, it's obviously not a clear cut and dry answer. There's a lot to talk about with relation to this topic, but it kind of takes money to make money. But at the same time, how much do we need to save and where should we be investing? So thank you for coming in on the income stream today. I appreciate you excited to chat about this very important topic today. Uh, let's just dive right in. Here we go. This is the Income Stream to help you achieve your dream All while we keep it clean, this is the Income Stream It's the kind of show where you can come and go But then you leave inspired with no fee required The Income Stream with Pat Flynn <laughs> Zenyan Plata says, spend everything Nice uh, probably not the best answer. And this is why we need to talk about this because there's a lot of ins and outs related to investing, right? And I also wanna make sure to have our personal financial situation taken care of too. I think that's gonna be step number one. We don't ever wanna put our own personal uh, finance situation as well as our family's financial situation in danger because of stuff we're trying to do in our business. So a lot of people who are just starting out, it's really important to understand that, you know, you can in fact have a little bit of a nest egg to give yourself a little bit more room. But at the same time, I will tell you that when I first got laid off and I started my business, it was the fact that I had to make it work that drove me and pushed me forward. Now, when it came to investing in my business, because I was bootstrapping, I was very reluctant to spend money. But looking back, I in fact would have probably made progress quickly or more quickly at least if I did indeed invest a little bit of money. And I'll tell you the quick story about when I first started investing my money. So the first time I invested money in my business was beyond this, just like starting a website. And um, even before I built an email list, that was a big mistake, something I actually wish I invested more money into early on. But my very first large investment in my business actually came after launching a study guide online on my architectural website. I was helping people pass an architectural exam. And what ended up happening was I wanted to create an audiobook to go along with it. In this audiobook, I had a microphone, I had a sound recording software on my computer. I said, you know what? I can read my own book and I can record it and I can sell that separately. There's no reason why I can't do this myself. Now, I remember specifically now that I'm an audiophile, the microphone that I had was a Logitech gaming microphone. It was just like a headset, little thin, thin uh, earmuffs and a thin little microphone, and it sounded very tinny. But I was like, you know what? As long as the content is out there and it's good, it's gonna, it's gonna make sense and it's gonna still be valuable. So I ended up spending three and a half days recording this entire thing, all 83 lessons within this book. I started reading it off and recording it into separate audio files. And by the end, after three and a half days of doing this, and in fact, I think it took over a week because there was a lot of mistakes in the middle and I had to go back and re-record things. It was not great. It was in, in fact very poor. And I started listening to it and I even shared it with a couple of friends of mine and they were just like, Ugh, this isn't, I don't think this is worth like putting out there. It almost makes the brand that you were building uh, less reputable, right? And so I was like, okay, well, what can I do here? Um, by the way, big shout out and thank you to Kyle. Welcome to Team Flynn Gold, my friend. Thank you, appreciate you. Um, I went back to a mastermind group that I was in because I was starting to get into these circles and trying to understand more about online business and the academy that I was a part of, the Internet Business Mastery Academy, uh, I joined them and the best part of that academy was in fact just access to other people in that space who were steps ahead of me, who were offering a lot of advice, who were sharing their own experiences. That was really inspirational. But I went in there and I said, hey guys, how do you how do you create an audiobook? I have a microphone, I tried to do it myself. I spent about a week doing it. And I'll tell you like the thread went wild because everybody was just not laughing, but they were like, OMG, I can't believe you tried to do this yourself. Hey, isn't your business actually making a little bit of money? C couldn't you invest in some of this for you? And I said, well, you can do that. <laughs> I didn't know that you could hire help for like this. And so they pointed me to a website called elance.com and elance and odesk later turned into what is now upwork.com. They, I think, merged. But I hired somebody on elance for $1,200. This was... 1.75 times the rent I was paying for my apartment at the time. And it was really hard. It was gut-wrenching, in fact, 
to spend that amount of money on something that I could hypothetically do myself and you know, maybe I could just try it again with maybe a different microphone or try better with better software or something. But but I trusted this this group. They've helped me before. They helped me launch my ebook and study guide. And what ended up happening was this person who I found who I hired on Elance, I spent twelve hundred dollars. It took about two weeks, so a little bit a little bit of time. But what I got back was so professionally done, and it was read by this woman named Trish, Voices by Trish. And what came back was a very, very well created product and I sold it on my website and I was able to get that money back. And so I think in your business, we have to think about specifically when we spend money, how is this going to help us, right? I think when we spend money in, in our personal life, there's obviously things that we have to take care of that we have to spend money on. And it's very similar in your business too. There are uh, expenses, right? Accounts payable, if you will, of things that you are just going to normally spend money on that are required for you to run your business, right? Web hosting, uh, podcast hosting, for example, and if you have any employees, if you're paying yourself, all these kinds of things are accounts payable, things that are recurring that you know are there. And you could hopefully start to get to a point where you're making more money than what you are spending on, although that's not always possible up front. You will have to invest some money and some time as well. But there comes a point where when you are able to, or, or perhaps you have a budget to spend money on, well, what do we spend money on or do we save it? And when you can understand the ROI, when you can go, okay, if I put this much money into this part of my business, this is how much I will get back. Not necessarily how much money, unless it's ads, and we'll talk about ads and things like that in a little bit, but when it comes to time as well. And time is worth way more than money because you can always make more money later but you can't get the time back that you spend. And this is where the big conundrum is when it comes to spending money on your business when you're just starting out. Especially when it comes to things like hiring a person to help you with your inbox or a VA or spending money on software to do things that you could likely do on your own, right? So this is where we have these conversations now about, well, okay, well, where do we then put our money and what do we don't put our money on? When I first started, I think besides the audiobook that I invested into, gosh, I didn't spend money on anything other than the regular things that I was spending money on, like hosting and whatnot, till, gosh, seven, no, 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 not seven, maybe four or five years later when I started these one-off projects, like my first book, Let Go, I needed to hire somebody. It became very apparent that I needed to pay money to have somebody help me design my book and edit my book, Let Go, this first book that I wrote in 2013. And... Then later I hired assistants to help me. I, I did go through a period where I did hire VAs from the Philippines, which was very, very good. And I'll talk about that in a little bit too. But I think first and, and foremost, let's talk about this. The idea that we need to have an emergency fund in our business. As we all know, or many of us know in our personal life, we should have an emergency fund for our personal finances. And typically it's six to 12 months of sort of what you need to live off of to pay for rent or your mortgage, to pay for food to come onto the table, and other things that you have to pay for, obviously, bills and whatnot. And in the business world, it's important to have an emergency fund as well. And from what I'm understanding, and again, I'm not the CFO of, of Team Flynn uh, and Team SPI, Matt is, and Matt has been amazing. And we've published a lot of content on smartpassiveincome.com with relation to cash flow and fundamentals and things like that. But typically speaking, and from what I hear, three months worth of expenses is, is sort of minimum. So before we start going on a spending spree, if you happen to have the opportunity to build a little bit of an emergency fund in your business, this can go a very long way. Number one, it can provide a lot of peace of mind, right? In case something were to happen or something were to break, or if you want to dip into this every once in a while for the purposes of investing into new experiments and R&D, research and development, that's pretty common as well. Having a, what we call a war chest. Now, some people separate their war chest as well as their personal uh, and business um, emergency funds. But I like this idea of having sort of a cash reserve for things that, okay, maybe I wanna invest in this, or maybe it's time to get into this software or something that um, you know is, is budgeted for, if you will. But an emergency fund is, is really key in my opinion. Just looking at the chat here really quick, looks like y'all 
connecting with each other, which is great. If you're watching live, say hello to your friends if you haven't already. If you're watching the replay, hashtag team replay in the comment section. Um, glad you're all here. Thank you, David. Consult the blind guy, Zenya, Samson, uh, Grandma Goody's in the house as well. Good to see you here, Tim. Fantastic. What's up, phone savers? Great to see you, Stephanie. So, you know, it's interesting, this, this idea of, okay, money in our business, we should have a little bit of a cash reserve for our emergency fund, right? That way, and of course, this was something that for people who had prepared ahead of time and who had built an emergency fund when COVID hit and then things started getting wild, they had more peace of mind. They had some sort of uh, safety net to ride out these tough times and then, of course, stabilize hopefully after that. So emergency fund for business for sure. And let's say, for example, that you have a business and you're spending maybe, you know, five to uh, $600 a month on hosting and all these other things that you might need to spend money on to run your business, especially if you're just starting out. Well, having a couple thousand dollars in a account within your checking account, and hopefully you have your personal and business finances separated, you have a business checking account, perhaps you have a business credit card or a debit card and you're building maybe some credit there. Um, having a separate account, and in fact, for me, what helps me is I, in fact, go to Inc. And I have, and I'm not going to show you into my accounts. I know I usually show you over the shoulder on things, but I'm not going to take you into my bank accounts. But you would see in my bank accounts a separate checking account specifically for the emergency fund, a checking account specifically for other things like taxes, and a separate account specifically for you know, um, just payroll and whatnot and sort of normal businesses and, and, and receivable and payable and whatnot. So those are kind of the three different uh, accounts that I have within the same. So they're just different checking accounts within the same business name, if you will, if that makes sense. So three months of expenses, really key. Next, let's talk about where we can invest money in to get time back. And that's where I feel, especially when we're just starting out. But even if you've been doing this for a while, we need to understand that if we are going to pay money for something, how is it in fact going to pay us back? whether that's more money, like with ads, or in this case, like I wanna talk about, more time back. Because I know a big struggle, and chat, let me know if you agree with this or if you felt this before, there comes a point where you go, okay, well, I could invest money in hiring help or in a software that could help me get some more time back, but I'm bootstrapping right now and I don't have that much money, so I could spend almost all my money on getting help and I get some time back, or I can save that money and do these things myself. And of course, there's pros and cons, and it would take a while to sort of audit this, but this is in fact what you need to do. We need to do a time audit to determine, okay, what are the things that we are in fact working on? Make a list. Put one thing that you do on a post-it note so you can see the sea of post-it notes, right? All, all around you, post-it notes. And then what you can do is you can then figure out, okay, of all these things that I do do, do do, we can figure out which of these things are worth keeping, meaning I might be doing some stuff, and this is very usual, we often do things that aren't even necessary or required. We just kind of fell into that trap of feeling busy, and we continue to do these things that in fact eat up our time. So we can, number one, by doing this time audit within our business, we can go, okay, well, number one, I can get some time back by just getting rid of some of these things, right? I no longer need this, or this is taking way too much time or what it's providing, right? Oftentimes it's 20% of the things we do that provide 80% of the results. So why not get rid of the unessentials, right? Let's get rid of the unnecessary. So that's number one. And number two, we can then see the sea of things that we do and determine, okay, of all these things that are required or that are needed, what only can I do? What are the things here that I have to do, like I have to do myself outside of budget, what are, the, what are the things that do require me, right? If you're a coach, okay, it, it requires your time to coach right now. Now, that being said, you can create an agency and hire coaches and have other people help your clients. But for right now, likely, okay, you need to spend the time hiring. Uh, you, you need to spend the time coaching people. So that's, you can't hand that off. This is an essential for you to do. Now, what is left over is really interesting because these are the things that we can, in fact, invest in software for often or invest in other people for. And if you imagine, if you start calculating how much time you'd actually be saving, you start to kind of compare, okay, how much money do I need to spend and how much time am I gonna get back? And the other thing to note about, about this is when you get this time back after investing money to get this time back, whether through a hire or through software or something, 
how much more can you do? How much more money could be made with that additional time that you have, right? A very common thing that I know from people who have started businesses after years of doing it, they often look back and go, wow, I wish I invested more money in hiring people or software to get some time back, right? We often try to do everything ourselves. And in some cases, you do have to do more things than you probably want to because of financial reasons. But in many cases, you have a decision to make. And oftentimes we err on the side of doing it ourselves because we can. And that's not always the best approach. Kyle here even says, where did Kyle? I wish I would have invested more early on in my time. I had to read Craig Valentine's perfect week formula twice to get my head around this. Do delegate or delete. That's essentially what we're talking about here, Kyle. Thank you so much for that. Miss Boy says, you make me laugh with your little quirky statements. What did I say? I don't even know what quirky thing I said. A lot of people have no emergency funds during this time due, the, due to the pandemic says Tim. You're right. I think some people have either dipped into their emergency funds or just haven't had the time or the ability to start uh, building their emergency funds because of that. Samson says, wow, you changed your shelves. Yes, I did. I'm experimenting. What do you all think? I like the masks on there. Got some uh, Back to the Future stuff, which you can't even see because the plastic on these pop figures is reflecting the light. So I might have to sort of replace those. But, you know, I don't know if it's because we're starting a little bit earlier today or because this is a topic about finances and people often avoid these topics. And that's the other thing. I think that especially entrepreneurs who are just starting out, who are rapping, who are coming from a different place, they used to work a nine to five or just haven't really dove in, into this before. Uh, it's very easy to get scared about the finances in our business. It feels better to do work and feel like we're making progress toward uh, additional income and and whatnot uh, versus, you know, actually going out there and thinking about, in fact, what we need to do and what we could, in fact, invest in to get some of that time back. Uh, Rashab, yo, time out. I like the shelf, looks good. Move the helmets more left. But my books are there, just kidding. I think I could do that for sure. The books are definitely overlapping, maybe a little bit too wide. Um, from the front view, it looks like they're almost right next to each other when they're actually overlapping. Consult the Blonde Guy says, due to government restrictions, can't have a second account till I have a legit business registered. Would a safe work to start or a secured credit card dedicated to just the business? Uh, potentially, you know, as far as a separate account, I think maybe it can just happen internally with your accounting software to just have money allocated for things like an emergency fund or investments in your business that can go a very long way. You don't necessarily need to have a separate account right now, but ideally you'd want to set up that business such that you can then get that second checking account separate from your personal stuff. That's always uh, best practice. Now, of course, there are people who are sole proprietors out there who um, still run their business from their personal stuff, but best practice is to have something separate, a separate EIN or employee identification number uh, which works similarly to a social security number. I'm not going to get into um, business formations and S-Corps and C-Corps and taxes and things like that, LLCs and whatnot. But yeah, for sure. Grandma Goody says, this is something I need to process. So thank you for covering this. You're welcome. This is a difficult topic to talk about. Oftentimes people avoid this, like I said. But where I think that we can get the most bang for our buck is to determine where we're spending most of our time and what is absolutely needed for us to do for example, Grandma Goody, you are the personality behind the camera. You need to show up. You need to hit record. You need to keep coming out with this content because that is your bread and butter and this is what you need to do. But when it comes to the editing, for example, might you be able to hand that off? And how much time might you get back if you were to hand that off to somebody else or pay somebody to do that? And would that be worth that amount of time and money, of course, right? So there's other things that we can think about when it comes to investing money to get some time back. Number one, there are one-off projects. I had mentioned that story earlier about paying to have a voiceover actor essentially read my book so that I could sell it. And I tried to do that myself and it didn't work out, not at all. And then I invested, it was a lot of money, it felt weird, but I got a lot of that back and that was really, really uh, eye-opening for me. So these one-off projects where you go, okay, this one-off project, 
Here's how it will help long-term. Here's how it inserts itself into the business. Here's how it could provide a return. Perhaps the one-off project, for example, is an online course that you're gonna be creating. Might there be uh, some way to invest into some help with relation to that? Or maybe you do spend some time because you're investing your time as well into creating that, but other things are then handed off or repeated projects are then paid for uh, with help or software. And that's where the second part of this comes in. We've talked about one-off projects and investing for that and being very clear with how this is going to help you back. Or, and this is more common, the recurring tasks that you do, right? The recurring tasks, the, th the, the things that kind of have to have to happen over and over again. For podcasters, it's this idea of after you hit record and after you stop recording, what happens after these recurring tasks to take that recording and pop it into all the places it needs to be so that the world can hear it. If you're a blogger, the editing, the um, upkeep of your website or the design of your website, is that something that you should be spending most of your time doing or should you be there building relationships and creating more content and perhaps even experimenting with then getting on the camera or getting behind the microphone, right? I hired a VA in 2014, a VA from the Philippines, and it was a very wise investment because although it did require some cash, uh, I was able to get a lot of time back for recurring tasks that were eating up a lot of my time and taking my time away from other things that I knew that I should be doing instead. But these tasks were really important. Around this time, I had a couple niche websites and I was building several more. The reason that I stopped working with this VA was because Google made some algorithm changes and the whole niche site scene changed almost overnight. Certain methods that were working were actually frowned upon and were not working out anymore. And I didn't want to become the expert in that space. It was just something I was doing on the side. So it eventually made sense to sort of like leave that part of what I was doing and, and focus on more higher level sort of authority type websites instead. Excuse me while I take a sip of my coffee. Phone savers is nailing it right here. Knowing where to place my attention is most crucial. And this comes with prioritization. This comes with understanding all the things that you might need to do. And then determining of all those things, like we mentioned earlier, what is most important? What can only you do or what requires you and only you? And then what could potentially be handed off to others? But going back to the VA stuff, you might be interested to know that uh, hiring a VA in the Philippines is a very popular thing for entrepreneurs, online entrepreneurs to do. Um, there is help worldwide, just so you know. But the Philippines in particular is very popular. I'm half Filipino myself and I can confirm a lot of this stuff about the culture is that Filipino pe people are amazing at speaking English. They and we, uh, or but they, um, in the Philippines teach English in school. It's essentially their national language, if you will, outside of Tagalog and the other dialects around the different islands in the Philippines. But everybody learns English there, right? So communication is much, much easier. Number two, as far as a culture, hardworking. They are people who are very loyal. Um, why I uh, let go of my VA was for a couple of reasons. Number one, those tasks were done. But number two, I wanted to hire people that could feel like they were part of my business with me. Um, hiring a Filipino VA is fantastic for specific tasks that repeat that you want done on time and done well that could be taught, right? You still have to hire and train. You can't just hire and expect things to happen magically. You still have to train. So just keep that in mind. If you are if you are indeed gonna invest in hiring some help for, for example, a virtual assistant overseas, you still have to train them. The best way to train would be through things like video and just showing them what to do. I know a lot of people who have hired VAs to help them edit their podcast. And you literally walk them through any video, what to do with the file, how to do it. And you can provide them all the inputs needed, for example, titles, descriptions, and whatnot in a spreadsheet, and you just tell them, go here, do this, do that, and you have a video. And the, the cool thing about a video is that if you train them in this way where you do a screen recording, whether it's through something like ScreenFlow, you can even screen record on QuickTime, uh, or something like Loom, which is a little bit easier to use and manage, uh, you then have this sort of library of content that if that VA were to leave or, or, mo or move or, or move on to something else, Somebody could easily come in and just watch those same videos and pick up right where you left off, right? So anyway, um, Filipinos, great. There are a couple places where you can go to find Filipino VAs. And one of those places is run by my good friend, Chris Docker. You can find that at virtualstafffinder.com. 
And then the other place would be onlinejobs.ph, .ph being the extension for websites in the Philippines, similar to .co.uk in the UK, but .ph, onlinejobs.ph. But Virtual Staff Finder does come with a fee, but they help manage that hiring process as a headhunter service to filter and find ones that are perfect for you. So I've used that, and that's what I use to hire my VAs. And it's true. They, they, they do great work. They do it on time. They do it well. And they don't the, – the, the thing that I was missing when I was working with my VA was this idea of, okay, well, I want you to find things that are broken and help me. And it's very unusual for people in the Philippines to overstep their boss or to tell their boss that something is wrong. They just do the job and do it well, right, if that makes sense. So when it comes to the investment for VAs in the Philippines, we'll start there. Um, it's, 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 it's kind of mind-boggling how little, relatively speaking, you have to pay for a VA in the Philippines. I had hired a VA for 40 hours a week for $600 a month. 40 That's 240 hours a month that I was getting back to do these things that I was doing myself. And they could do more of them. They could do them faster, better for $600. It almost feels like stealing in a way. And it, in fact, like was so weird for me to know that I was only paying 600. I mean, that's a lot of money, right? But consider 240 hours that you could get back. Um, I mean, that's, 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 I mean, what, what's the math on that, right? So $600 divided by 240, that's $2.50 an hour. That's that's not even anywhere near minimum wage here in the U.S., right? But we're not talking about the U.S. We're talking about the Philippines. And it felt so weird to me that I, in fact, um, offered more money to this person. I said, hey, um, what if I pay you $800 a month? Would that be cool? Like, I want to help. I, like, you've been doing great work. I want to support you and your family. And I feel like I could I can invest more in you. And I wanted to pay this person more because I wanted to keep them for longer, right? He said, no. He did not want more money. And I couldn't understand until I started talking to more people. And it, it made sense to me because even my mom confirmed this. My mom, who is Filipino as well. When you have a lot of money in the Philippines, you have a target on your back, right? When you're making too much money, people start looking around or people start coming out of the woodwork to ask for money from you. And so he was he was perfectly fine with $600 a month at, two, at 40 hours a week, right? Which is crazy. Nothing against Philippine VAs, but they're not likely to take initiative to improve or show what could be done better. They're great at yeah, exactly. This is what I was mentioning earlier. This is and this is true. This is of no offense to Filipino people. This is just their culture. Um, you're not going to have people take initiative typically. Uh, if you find somebody in the Philippines who does, great. Reward them for that initiative and train them to continue to look for things and ways to improve. But if you're looking for like a workhorse, somebody to in fact continue to do these things over time. Um, they don't they don't lollygag, they do the work, but they're not gonna take that initiative, right? Like Stephanie's saying, and I agree with that 100%. It does feel like exploitation to pay so little. That's, that's how I felt. But I, I offered more, they didn't want it, right? It, it, it's just the economies of scale and the, the countries and the way that money U.S. money and how much it's worth in pesos, it's it's just it's just crazy, right? It's just crazy. I was thinking to double my VA's invoice amount for Christmas. Would it be an okay thing to do? Uh, bonuses are an okay thing to do for sure. Bonuses are great. Um, this is um, it's actually traditional to reward a Filipino VA with a bonus. Um, that goes a very long way uh, for sure. But as far as a doubling of the rate, for example, I think that. Again, it's going to be dependent on who the VA is and, and what their thoughts are on um, money in general. Uh, it, 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 if, if you feel like you can do that, sure. Please answer, sir. I don't know what your question is because you were spamming and I don't like that. Right? We cool now, though? We cool? High five? Okay, we cool. All right. So, talking about VA. Now, where most of my money now in my business is going is to a team 
that is in-house, actual employees. I have 10 people working for me now, and that is the major chunk of the expenses in our business. It costs nearly, I think, half a million dollars a year to keep the business running with employees of this nature. But it is by far an amazing investment because we're able to get way more done. We're able to provide way more value. And it took me a while to get to this point for sure. And to get over the idea of like, wow, what if I were to save that half million dollars? And me coming from a background of traditional personal finance and things like this, like, and not in a business mindset, when I came into this world, it's like, oh my gosh, a half million dollars. What if I just do all the work myself and I invest that half million dollars in, you know, a fund or something like I could get returns on it and be set for life. But I also know that if I were to do all the things that all of my team does with all their specialties, with all of the time that they spend on their specialties and the initiative that each of them kind of take on their own as employees, as a part of the business, um, I would be run to the ground. I, I would not be able to do it. So I did have to make a decision. And I made this decision in 2017 to invest a lot of the money that I was making back into the business to grow it, to invest in more team, to invest in um, providing more value for you and investing in new website designs, investing in creation of courses, in uh, a film crew to hire, to potentially make things that we're doing even better, right? Like it's, 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 something that I was very afraid to do, um, hire employees. I'm not going to tell you what's right for you, but um, in the beginning, it wasn't right for me. It just didn't feel right. I also uh, truly benefited from hiring an agency to do, to do a lot of the work that I needed help done. Uh, and that was great. Um, and that includes people who were doing graphic design for me, um, website design, um, editing, um, both blog posts and podcast episodes and, and also videos as well. But there came a point where I knew that if I invested more into my team, that I would get a lot more back. And in the year and a half that I have had now an employee, t uh, employees and in-house team members, it, it's been it's been a radical difference, a difference mostly in how these employees of mine have taken ownership in the parts of the business that they do um, and step up and even create their own stuff. Um, a clear example of ROI in this case is SPI Pro, our pro community. This was something that we've had on the list for a while. We've always wanted to create a community, but because of the pandemic, we wanted to move this forward. And I was basically hands off during the entire process. Everything from the graphics to the software where Mindy came in, she's our solutions manager who pieces everything together. Um, the copywriting for it, which is very much Matt's realm, to then now hiring people, Jillian, a community manager to come in. Um, we have now added an additional $400,000 a year in our business from pushing this project forward. And we were able to do that within a two month time period. And that's just one of those clear examples of, okay, let's invest in, and this is, this is, this is big boys stuff. This is big girl stuff, right? This is like a huge investment in team to get a much bigger investment in ROI in return, right? But I never thought I would, I, when I started my business, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna do this all on my own. The whole purpose of starting a business is so that I can not work a nine to five job, to not have a bunch of stress, and I can just sit back and relax and watch the passive income roll in. That was my thought. And there came a point around 2011, 2012, where I started to, no to notice that, number one, as the brand was growing, a lot of my time was being spent communicating an email, and building things and it was eating up a lot of my time. I was in fact working more than I was when I was in architecture because I kept continuing to build and wanting to grow and help and serve more people. Um, but I had a choice to make. I either could, number one, continue on the same path of continuing to do everything on my own to a point where I knew I was going to burn out. And I've seen this time and time again, my buddy Chris Ducker, he ended up in the hospital because he was doing so much work all on his own. I know some other entrepreneurs who ended up suffering mentally, their relationships started suffering because they continued to try and grow and do it all on their own. I also know some other entrepreneurs like Paul Jarvis, the author of Company of One, who has been very diligent with, you know what? I'm okay not growing. I'm okay being where I'm at, making this amount of money every year, doing this amount of work, and I'm not gonna hire a team, I'm not gonna go big, 
I'm just going to do what I'm doing as a, 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 an agency and, and just keep it at that. And that's fine too. But that was a conscious decision that Paul made. Now, I made the conscious decision to grow and I made the decision that I was going to grow with a team because if I didn't, I either would stay stagnant and um, you know keep my mental health and relationships and whatnot or grow and burn out or grow with a team and still have the mental health and the relationships and whatnot too, right? He does believe in hiring. You're right, Scooby. Um, company of one doesn't mean you only are your own self in your business and you don't get help, but it basically means, hey, you don't have to. And this is a big lesson. Um, this was a key decision that I made. I want to grow. I want to go big. I want to I wanna go bold. I need to hire a team. I want to reinvest this money. I have all my personal finance situation taken care of such that if I were to lose everything in the business, I'm still okay, right? And that's, that's a great position to be in, but it took a long time to get here. But there's other people like Paul. He's like, you know what? I don't want to grow. Don't need to grow. Perfectly, perfectly fine where I'm at on my little island. He does live on an island. And it's like in Canada somewhere, I think. And, and that's perfectly fine too. It's when we get into autopilot without knowing that we're in autopilot that things start to cause trouble. We either continue to grow on our own and burn out. Or we continue to spend, 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 spend when really you didn't want to, right? Because we're in this sort of fascination, especially in the US is grow bigger, hustle, work 90 hours a week, spend more money, grow, make more money. And then of course, when I talk to people who burn out and I go, well, what do you really want? They're just like, I wanna be financially stable and be with my family. And I'm like, well, why do you have 400 employees then? You could do the same thing on a much smaller scale. I'm like, well, I could just got caught up in the growth Right, I just got caught up in the growth. And this is where a lot of people spend money when they don't need to, to go back to the whole purpose of this conversation here, is you need to know what your goals are, right? And spending money to support these goals is great. But if you're spending money just because you think you need to grow and you're not quite sure where you wanna to go to, that, that's a problem. We're blindly spending money and almost gambling with that money, if you will. Gambling not just on money and potentially getting an investment back, but gambling with your mental health, gambling with the relationships that you have, gambling with your stress levels, right? Garrett says, to be honest, I want to work as little as possible. I love that. And if you know that, Garrett, that's fantastic. And the struggle and the battle is going to be, how do I, number one, be okay with that? Knowing that there's going to be other people who are going to question why I'm okay, not growing and staying small. And again, I don't know where you're at or what your, um, what your stance is on this, but it is an internal battle. Do I grow? You see opportunities. Are you going to say, are you going to be able to say no to them because they could make you more money, but they're going to spend you more, spend more time. They're going to require more time. So the hard thing about growth is growth creates opportunities. Opportunities take time and time can take you away from these other things that you might be more inclined to enjoy. And so it's almost like a catch 22. You grow as your business becomes successful, but as these more opportunities come your way, you might say yes to more and then, excuse me, um, start going downhill from there. And we don't, want, we don't want that to happen for sure. Kat says, Pat, can you please talk about when it is necessary to hire more people? I think that number one, and this is just overall, I think if, I, th I think a wise investment is investments in your business that help you mentally, right? Investments in your business that help you mentally. Um, and I don't mean like spa treatments, although that could potentially be the case for sure. But I mean, if you are just so tired and so stressed out about, for example, your email. I had a point where I had 10,000 unread emails. This is back in 2014. And then I hired Jess because Mentally, that was that was crushing me. It was crushing me because I knew that I wasn't able to reply to everybody, but it was also crushing me because I knew that every person who sent an email was going to be let down. And so mentally, I had to go and hire so that I know I could continue to take care of people as I was continuing to grow. Either that or just tell people, sorry, I can't help you. And I wasn't I wasn't okay with that personally. So 
you might be spending a lot of time on something like editing your podcast and it's just driving you nuts. Hey, there's a sign that maybe you can spend money to have other people help you do that. Whether you spend money on actual employees in your business or an agency to help you or even an intern perhaps or somebody at a lower level to come in that you can train a VA even as well. Could use a spa right now, but yuck. <laughs> I love a good massage, says Phone Savers. Balance for sure, says Peasant Uprising for sure. I would just, I just would, I had a business to support that aligned with my values. Massage and chocolate. Now we're, now we're getting to a completely different part of the conversation, but I think, you know, there's a good lesson there. It's important to stay mentally fit. It's important to stay happy. And if you need a spa day, if you need a massage, if you need some chocolate, use that as motivation. Reward yourself after completing a task or completing a project. I love, and this is me, we can talk about productivity on another day, but for me, what motivates me is the reward on the other end. What motivates you might be something else. Um, accountability and rewards on the other end is what drives me moving forward. So whenever I have a new project, I often think about, okay, well, what is the reward for me on the other end? And many times it's the reward of helping and serving others, but there's a very personal selfish reward on the other end too. Hey, when I finish this project, I'm going to treat myself with just like a week straight of playing Fortnite every day or a brand new DeLorean model that just came out or, or what, ha what have you. You have to know what motivates you, right? Pat, you talk a lot of things. It's very useful. Thank you, Miss Boyce. Yeah, we're just having an open conversation today, right? Now, other things to think about with relation to Kat's question here, how do we know when it's time to hire employees? I think, you know, number one, you have to know where you want to go. Employees is a whole different ballgame, though. It was really nice, I will say, to hire an agency to do a lot of the stuff and just be myself in my business on paper, right? It was just me, my I'm, I'm the sole owner of this business. There are no other employees. I'm the only member of this, of this business, single member LLC. And as a result of that, hiring an agency to do a lot of the stuff was clean and easy. It was a little bit more expensive because typically there is a add-on, right? A person in an agency that you hire might require a certain amount of time and therefore money, plus there's a little bit of an agency fee added on. So by hiring an employee, I'm able to wipe that agency fee and essentially get more of that person's time and attention for the business back. But with employment comes a lot of paperwork, especially if they live in another state tax implications. Um, are you going to support them with health care? Are you going to support them with a 401k or profit sharing? There's a whole load of other things that come in when you have employees. Now, I'm very grateful that right, right before I hired my team, essentially what I did to make it easy was I just bought the agency. The agency that was working for me, I bought the agency. I acquired the company. And so I was able to have the same team working for me and now they were just dedicating all their time and I didn't have to pay the agency fee anymore. It just made sense. And what came with that was a person who was in charge of the HR and the administrative stuff who was taking care of that for, for me as well and, and continues to take care of that for me here in Team SPI as well. Cool. You guys are still talking about chocolate. Are you team milk chocolate or are you team dark chocolate? Let me know. I'm team like 66 percent <laughs> is that an actual percentage of chocolate like are there only increments or can you actually have like a range pat flynn does your team have the usual eight hour days or do they work less but focus on a, a, a effectivity or efficiency so, so it, 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 it's a little bit more organic it's not as straightforward it's not eight hour days we don't require and i i made this very clear because when I hired the agency or when I bought the agency, the agency previously was working on a time basis because they needed to keep track. It was an agency, right? I need to know how much, this was Matt, I need to know how much you're spending, how much time are you spending on this person's project? How much time are you spending on this person's project? Because this is how we calculate our worth, right? And, and sort of, you know, how much, how we can make sure that we're getting an ROI back on the client work that we're doing. How do we know if we're going over and losing money? They have to keep track of time. For me, I made it very clear you do not have to actually track your time. I don't care how much time you spend on something. I just need the stuff done. And so I prefer that because it offers a little bit more freedom for people to get creative and to become efficient. 
And there are some days when I see some of my teammates, they get their work done. Yo, they get the rest of the day off or they, they move on to the next project or whatever they want to do. They were done with their project. By the time they needed to, we work in two week sprints. In fact, Wednesdays are our sprint, sprint review days. And at 10.30, no, 9.30, um, in about an hour and 15 minutes, we're going to have our weekly two-week sprint check-in where everybody comes in and they go, here's what I was able to accomplish. Here's where I'm at now. Here's where we are in the timeline of this project. And we seem to be on track or no, we're not on track. We need to catch up. So let's allocate a little, a little more hours and time to this and take it away from this. But... There are some days where I see that they're up till midnight because they have the time and they just want to. So again, that that freedom, you know, is great, I think. Team chocolate period says nomadables. Nice. I like how you think. Just get it done. Just get it done, says Jamie. Chocolate and caffeine. Isn't there caffeine in chocolate? Well, I need to go to my lesson. Have a good one, y'all. See you, Manos. Thanks for coming in. We'll see you maybe on the stream later today. Uh, on Twitch. Love this approach, Pat Flynn. Thanks for the insight. I wondered if there's somebody who has this approach already. Pat, do you have like brainstorming sessions uh, with the team? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. They are in fact in the calendar. Um, we had one a couple months ago with relation to the webinar course that's coming out next week. And we have one uh, coming up with relation to content coming out in 2021. And that's a team thing. Um, typically, we have certain team members come in who are are responsible or have some sort of responsibility within that particular topic, but uh, that, that's who's brainstorming because we're all kind of in it together, right? And then what happens is we will have then certain members of the team take ownership of those things. And that's one of my favorite things to do with a team as well is to go, okay, this is the project. It's your project, right? I'm going to check in with you and here's when it's due. Here's what we're supposed to do. But hey, you come up with the way to do it. And the reason why I love that is because this this is, and this is a huge lesson here, something that I learned just a couple of years ago with relation to managing a team. And I'll tell you a quick sort of uh, story or, or um, yeah, it's, it's a story. Just escape. What's another word for story? My th thesaurus isn't working today. Um, anyway. I don't know what war it was, but there was a war at one point and the commander had a set of instructions and strategies for their generals and, and the entire ar army to, to do. And so this commander who had created all these plans, you know, go here and do this and attack at this time and do all these things, it just wasn't working, right? And every time the commander had very specific set of instructions, something would always change, right? Because the moment a plan doesn't go according to plan, the rest of that plan is off, right? The rest of that plan is off. And so everything kind of gets screwed up at that point. So the commander decided that instead of giving the specific, all the steps, all the entire plan, he gave the generals the commander's intent. And this is really important for you to offer for yourself and for your team. And this is something that we do in our business too. We offer our employees who are responsible for things the commander's intent. That means from my position and Matt's position as COO, we go, here's what we want done and here's when we want it done by. This is our intent. You come up with the plan yourself. And so we give that responsibility. No, not tail. It's It'll come to me, it'll come to me. Plot, no, not plot. Fable, story, plot. Man, it's literally on the tip of my tongue. This was like Jamiroquai the other day. Remember when we were trying to figure out what that band, I, like somebody said Moby and we we're trying to come up with the name of the song, but then it was actually Jamiroquai and Virtual Insanity was that the thing that we were looking for. Anyway, uh, Chris Tucker says, yo, good. And I do mean good. VAs are worth, yo, Chris Tucker in the house, everybody. Let's say hello to Chris. High five. Thank you for being here today, my friend. Uh, Chris is the one who, in, in fact, inspired me to hire a team finally and to initially start working with VAs. It was Chris's service that I mentioned earlier, virtualstafffinder.com. If you want to check out a VA, that's perfect for you. And uh, Chris is, is the man when it comes to that stuff and also helping build your personal brand. And of course, hiring help and having people under you 
in your business to help you build your personal brand is obviously really key too. So what's up? Anecdote, thank you. Anecdote, Keisha got it right. Thank you. <laughs> so what's up, Chris? Good to see you here, my friend. Um, Parables, a good man. This is a, it's a great chat with uh, some amazing uh, vocabulary in the house, which is great. So when it comes to paying things, paying for things, let's go back to our original topic here. Uh, thank you for letting me express a little bit more about the commander's intent, right? And this has worked out extremely well because when you have employees specifically who are working for you, they feel good about taking ownership. This is how we help our employees feel like there are, there is room for growth. This is how we can sort of understand who within our own employees is sort of like worthy of a, of a manager or a director role, for example, um, to help them take charge. And this, of course, frees my time and Matt's time. Now I don't have to come up with a plan because that is respon like you are responsible for this. You come up with a plan. You tell us if you need to hire people or to get things done or invest in software to make this happen. I don't care how you do it. This is the intent. Go make it happen, right? So there we go. There we go. So let's talk a little bit more about mindset when buying things or investing in your business, right? And Chris has, I'm sure, a ton to add to this. Um, he is somebody who I've learned from when it comes to investing in your own business, investing in help, investing in software to get more back, right? That's where, what I think is one of Chris's specialty for sure. Uh, definitely check him out, chrisducker.com, also the founder of Upreneur. Uh, Upreneur.com and the Upreneur Summit. He also manages some really cool accelerator programs and some uh, like higher level coaching programs. Uh, Chris is the man. Uh, and one of my best friends, by the way. So good to see you here, my friend. So before you actually take that credit card out and you spend money, I want you to ask yourself if this is in fact necess a necessary purchase or is it a nice to have? This is something that I'm trying to teach the kids right now. Um, and if you've heard me on the Twitch stream, if you watch my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash hot calls only, you'll find me and my kids channel there where we play games and stuff. But I use that opportunity to teach. And the other day, Kaoni, who is my son, uh, wanted to buy this sort of $20 package of Fortnite skins and pickaxes and other kinds of things that you could get. It's all just decoration, but it makes your character look cool. And um, he knows I do this. Every time he says he's gonna buy something, I always question it. And he goes, oh, you just don't want me to buy this. And I go, no, no, no. I just want you to think about this purchase before you pull the trigger. Because sometimes we buy things because we think we want them, but then we don't actually end up using them. Or it's what's called an impulse buy. And impulse buys are very common in business too, because we might have a budget and we might go, oh, that would be nice. But is it necessary? And with regards to Kaoni and the skins and stuff, it's not ne like none of that stuff is quote unquote necessary, right? But the question to ask is, does this bring you the joy? Does this provide long-term joy for you? Is this something that next week you're not even gonna care about? And he did buy the, th the skins and he is doing that because it's a version of the skin in a Halloween format that is pretty rare and it did, it did he liked the idea of it being special. So, okay, cool, he purchased it. In many cases, um, I'm able to coach him out of decisions or at least help them think a little bit more deeply about these decisions to make purchases. And we need to do the same thing in our business too, right? We need to consider, okay, is this thing that I'm actually gonna be spending money on? Especially if it's like a recurring monthly payment. Like, does this, is this required for me? Or a necessary, or is this a nice to have? Now, where we get mixed up in this is if we make it a nice, if we put it in the nice to have category because we're like, oh, well, I can do that myself. Well, we have to then consider, well, what could we do with that time? And is it required for me to get my time back or what could we then use that time for? And so these are the kinds of questions we need to ask ourselves, right? Um, I think there are some very clear things that are very uh, easy and, 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 and gonna be very obvious for you for spending your money on. Some of them are necessary, like, you know, I need to spend money to host my podcast on Buzzsprout so that I can, you know, get my podcast out there in the world. I need to invest in an email marketing company that I can rely on, like ConvertKit, for example. Full disclosure, I'm an affiliate and an advisor for the company. But there are some things that are great that I could probably spend money on, but don't fit into our goals right now and therefore don't need to be spent. Um, they, they don't need to be purchased right now. Cool. 
such a great habit building life hack to teach. Yeah, I want, I like, uh, my parents had some money problems growing up, um, not growing up, but like when I was a kid, they would often get into a lot of fights about money. So money, especially in families and with relation to kids and, and relationships to me is a, a it, it's not a sore subject. It's a very important one because I remember like, just like in the movies, right? Parents arguing downstairs. I love my parents. They're still together. They're fantastic. But I remember when I was a kid sitting on the stairs so they couldn't see me listening to them argue about money. And that like that that conditioned me to realize how much money could be potentially evil um, and how important it was for me to manage money so that I don't ever find myself in the same situation with April or my business partners or with myself. Right. Albert says, good morning. Keep up the good work. Glad to be able to listen to you today. Haven't been able to do it lately. Talk to you later. Albert. Albert, I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you so much for coming in. Agree. Same here, Pat Flynn. Pat, I can't believe the hour has flown by. The hour always flies by. You know what? Because we're always talking about something really important. And that's what I love about this show. And thank you. There was actually uh, an email that came in yesterday. I'm not going to mention the name, but that inspired this topic today. And um, Tuesday's topic yesterday's was inspired by Karma, who's here in the chat right now. He's one of the moderators here. And uh, really cool, we have a special guest, uh, Chris, come on with, with, without uh, prior notice, which is really cool. And we have another special guest coming in tomorrow. So I hope that you come in tomorrow, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. One more time, that's 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. And this is a very important topic. All I'm gonna say is one word, brand. And this is so important and relevant for everybody, whether you are a single member of your business and you're the only employee, or you have a full-on team that you have who's now understanding the idea of the commander's intent, like we talked about. It's really important, and I hope that you show up tomorrow. And we're, again, going to have a special guest on the show, and that's going to be uh, really key. So I'm glad we were able to, we were able to talk about um, money today and finances and saving money, spending money. Again, try to get to that point where you have about three months of your typical accounts payable um, saved up. Uh, that, that's going to be your emergency fund in your business. Um, and then investing money in places where you can get some time back. And the big lesson, knowing where your goals are. Because if you just spend money aimlessly, you might be spending money in places that you don't need to. If you don't want to grow, why are you spending money to grow in that place? Or if you do want to grow, why are you spending all this time doing this when you can invest to get uh, results a little bit faster? So hopefully at least this gave you some inspiration to think about and to go back to finish up here to the exercise that we talked about in the beginning. We want to do a time on it. Where are we spending our time? Or read the book Virtual Freedom from Chris Ducker here, which has an amazing exercise called the three lists of freedom where you can, in a very similar way, I love using post-it notes, he uses columns, but to determine, okay, where are we spending our time and where do we not need to spend our time? What is necessary but doesn't require our own personal blood, sweat, tears and what is required of us that only we can do and this is where we can start to determine okay where should we and where we shouldn't be spending money so thank you so much for today i appreciate you hit that like button if you haven't already and if you're here and you haven't done so already hit that subscribe button and that bell notification icon too so you don't miss any more content coming your way thank you so much for today i appreciate you did you catch the secret word let me know thank you so much and uh, we'll see you tomorrow, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. Team Flynn for the win. Here we go. This is the income stream to help you achieve your dream. All while we keep it clean, this is the income stream. It's the kind of show where you can come and go, but then you leave inspired with no fee required. The income stream with Pat Flynn. Yo, thank you so much for today. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Thanks for the great discussion. You're amazing. Peace out, y'all. Bruh.